episode nine. Can you believe it, guys? Nine. I feel like I'm so just uh, seasoned. I know that's like, that's baby moves, right, compared to these other podcasts. So this is Dave Hall. Hey, guys. What's up, Dave? How you doing? Um, So Dave and I met, what you got referred in here as a patient, first of all. Sent me over here. Um, so I'm going to let you introduce yourself and then we'll kind of talk about how we've kind of interacted a little bit. And I'm just, I really am interested to have you here cause I don't know that much about you to be honest. So yeah. I'm, I'm wanting sure. to find out about you. Okay, cool. Uh, Dave Hall, I run a business called the Gogi Fitness Systems. Uh, we're over in the Midtown area here in Birmingham. You're going to realize like I'm the dog, like that's a squirrel. So tell me real quick, <laughs> what does a Gogi, like, what is that? Oh God. Okay. So, uh, uh, here's the convoluted story for that. So, um, there are two basic rules in business, and I broke both of them <laughs> when you name your business, all right? The first one is, is don't pick a name that people can't pronounce, like the farm. That's a real simple name. People yeah. can't pronounce that, right? Now, the acronym, mouthful, terrible idea. Yeah. Yeah. But still, that's a good name. Yeah. Gogi, people look at it, and they're like, a gog. I was a little unsure. Yeah, nobody, nobody knows how to pronounce <laughs> it. And then second of all, I picked a name that nobody knows what it means. So uh, good and bad. Uh, yes. I kind of like the, the it, ethereal, like, eh, what is that? It allows an opportunity for this story yes. right here, which is that uh, uh, it's pronounced Agogi, or at least that's how I pronounce it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, the Agogi was the school that Spartan youth went through in order to become citizens. Ah. So I already you know, learned something. 12 years ago, yeah. when I was naming my business, two things were major influences. One, the movie 300 was out. Mm-hmm. And, uh, uh, but the other was that um, I wanted, I didn't want to name my gym like hyperbolic systems or something like that, you know. <laughs> and, and I wanted something that was dynamic and mm-hmm. positive, um, but also spoke to the nature of the gym. Mm-hmm. And for us, the gym is, is a school. It's a place to go and to work on yourself. So I think of it more like a dojo, mm-hmm. more of a place to practice what we do out in the real world yeah. and face those types of challenges. And so between the movie 300 and uh, uh, a Stephen Pressfield novel called The Gates of Fire, mm-hmm. that whole concept of the yeah. yogi really appealed to me. Yeah. So that's... Putting that's people through their, the trials to... Yeah, right. And uh, um, it's interesting. Uh, my business has really evolved over the years, um, you know, when I started out, you know, I, again, you want, when you start out in this business, I think you think of your clients as a reflection on your skill set. Yeah. Right. So the more dynamic your clients are, the more powerful they are, the more athletic they are, they reflect upon your gym. Mm-hmm. Right? And they, they, you know, so you know, oh, he goes to such and such gym, you know, he's, these are powerful dudes. It's how you can build your brand. Exactly, yeah. right? Um, but I'm, I'm an outlier, right? I'm not... I'm well, what's not, your, I don't know if it's your tagline, you told me your gym is a gym for misfits. Yeah. It's so, like the lost... Yeah, yeah, we're the island of, of misfit toys. Yeah. Right, so um, my gym really attracts those people that don't, aren't very well catered to by mainstream fitness Mm -hmm. right they are either they're older uh they're deconditioned they have backgrounds that were not athletic Mm -hmm. you know um a lot of my clients are 30s and 40s and they didn't play sports in school um for many of them you know they're approaching middle age and going oh gee i need to do something before all of this falls apart and um they're intimidated by the gym. Which a lot of people are. Yeah. The whole, you know, they had bad PE experience or whatever. Mm-hmm. They tend to be, um, my clients tend to be a little more on the introverted side. Mm-hmm. We're kind of nerdy. We geek out on Star Wars. And, and, yeah. and, and in fact, uh, gym conversation today revolved around uh, Infinity War and the new Star Wars movie. I was going to so. say, I thought it would be Solo. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I'm interested. Was that you? Was that your youth? Were you not so much into sports or have a bad PE experience? Like, what was your story? So, um, I, I'm, I grew up in the golden era of suburban childhood. Mm-hmm. So, I grew up um, not too far from here in Pelham. Um, my range as a kid was literally two subdivisions. 
So I rode my bike. We built BMX trails. You actually went outside? I went outside and played, <laughs> right? Um, and so I played sports, and I had all of these different things. I didn't do formal sports too much. Mm-hmm. I played Little League Baseball. Um, I played soccer. I played basketball. But by the time I got to high school, um, that so the, the high school that I went to didn't have a football team. Mm-hmm. We tried to put together a soccer team, and the coach was way more enthusiastic than we were, and so that just <laughs> didn't happen, right? Um, so mixed, I mm-hmm. would say. Uh, but generally, my high school experience was more towards the arty, you know, cool, uh, wear black all the time, mm-hmm. you know, listen to alternative music type. Which aspect. I would say is not your typical gym owner down the road. No. Which is kind of interesting. <laughs> and if for anybody listening to the podcast, Dave's a pretty big guy. Like, yeah. it, to look at you, you'd say, oh, this guy probably played football. He's been a powerlifter his whole life. That's not the case, which I think is very, very cool. No, actually, I didn't really get into... My introduction really into fitness was through martial arts. Mm. And so I was a martial What was your arts. first? So oddly enough, in my 20s, I started taking Tai Chi. Mm. So I took sort of the backwards route into martial arts. Usually people start hard style and go soft style. Mm-hmm. Um, but I started with, uh, uh, with Tai Chi, again, like the nerdiest of all martial arts, right? I mean, if you're going to be a martial <laughs> arts nerd, that's about as far as you can go. It's getting pretty cool it. now, though, man. <laughs> well, yeah, right? It's re-emerging, yeah. Um, and then, so I did that for about 10 or 12 years, um, bounced around through a bunch of jobs that just weren't good fits for me, and um, was teaching uh, Tai Chi at the JCC, and went ahead and got certified as a personal trainer, mm-hmm. and sort of segued into fitness through there. Um, so when did the gym open? How long has that been up and going? The gym, I actually started at Lakeview um, 12 years ago, as a personal trainer and then got my license as massage therapist and a gogi as it exists right now is about 10 years old. Oh, wow. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. And for, for a gym, that's ancient. Yeah. Right? That's, that's actually pretty it's established. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, um, it's good. We have a good community. Um, we're small, but mm-hmm. I like it that way so that I can, you know, I keep my hands in everything. Yeah. So uh, to kind of back up a little bit, it's interesting that you said like, You're kind of the gym or the island of misfit toys. But if you look probably, maybe even now, but definitely 10 years down the road, that may be the more common gym. I mean, if you look at the youth that are coming out, they're probably less, on average, less active, more into the stuff we would deem nerdy, right? Like my, our nephew that's, what, just turning seven, he can code already and all this stuff. Like, it's just crazy. But, like, these kids may come out of high school, college, into their first jobs where they get some uh, expendable income and not have ever went through athletics or be very well conditioned or have explored their body, you know, which is a lot of what you're kind of saying. It's a, exactly. it's kind of a training ground, but it's more like a learning um, environment of, like, figuring out stuff. But I just that's going to become more common, in my opinion, versus the gym setting I grew up in was most of your old athletes that are all beat up. You know, I grew up with the – you know, go to the YMCA to lift weights and it was all these big guys and we were all just meathead idiots and, you know, did all that stuff. But that was what I grew up in. It was not what I am interested in now by any means. So I just think that's kind of cool that you were kind of almost ahead of your time, not by uh, marketplace driven, you know, needs, but more just what you were interested in, what you wanted to see happen. Natural inclination. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, to that, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And and speaking towards kids today, kids today, I've got, <laughs> I got, I have three daughters. Um, my oldest is 21. My youngest is 16. How old are you? Sorry, 46. Yeah, you're all right. You look super young. Well, thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. Man. You know, so 21, 18, and 16. Wow, cool. Um, and so, like I said, growing up, my range as a kid was two full subdivisions. Mm-hmm. So at any point during the day, especially now during mm-hmm. the summer, my mom had no idea where I was. <laughs> right? There were probably like a handful of phone numbers that she could call. Yep. Hey, have you seen Dave? If she needed to track me down. Um, but other than that, her best bet was to go out on the back porch and just holler until I heard mm-hmm. her. Right? Um, by contrast, when my kids were growing up, their range of play was the end of the block. Yeah. Right? By your decision-making process? Um, 
or geographic location? Geographic location, but a sense of security. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, we didn't, we did when they were little. We didn't live in the same neighborhood uh, that I grew up in, so that wasn't a possibility. Mm-hmm. And culturally, that's just not. That's not what you do anymore. It's interesting how that's changed, and I'm big into. Uh, kind of a lot of, I bring it up all the time, like Bruce Lipton's idea of like the biology belief, but it's interesting to think, um, you know, chicken or egg, like, are we creating more of that? It's just like the scarcity mindset. If you think, eh, there's not enough dollars for everybody, I need all my dollars. But if we start to think, and I'm not a parent, so I can't say this by any means, but I grew up the same way you did. I mean, I was literally, my mom was like, see you later. Yeah. Um, if something like if I needed, you know, I remember the one this is stupid, but I like, I needed to get a haircut and she was just screaming and I was like, well, that ain't happening. And I just kept kept running around, but that was, you could do that, you know, but it's just, I always think like, man, are we creating more of that cultural norm of like, man, it's not as secure because we, we keep, you know, tightening the leash, which I understand there's real threats out there. There's a lot of stuff that has changed. But it's just, it's always interesting to me, like, is that getting worse due to mindset or is it really worse that there's more, you know, obviously there's trafficking and, you know, yeah. abductions and all those things yeah. that are real. I'm not trying to say that. It's just, you know, it's a thought. And it's, it, I agree with you. I think it's very fascinating, you know, so um, my childhood and, and ranging through the neighborhoods was... Uh, the late seventies and the early eighties, mm-hmm. right? The Atlanta child murders were like in like seventy nine, yeah. and that was like the big thing that sort of freaked everybody out. Just a hop, right? skipping, like, and jump from here, right? Yeah. Um, and so, as as our awareness of what's possible out in the world, you know, by you know, it's the double edged sword of information technology, <laughs> right? You know, yeah. All the world's knowledge is available in your front pocket. You get the good and the bad. You know, yes, you get the bad with the good, and our natural inclination is to gravitate towards the bad. Mm-hmm. We pay much more attention to the horrible things that are happening in the world than we do to the good things that are happening in the world. Sadly, that's so. And and so, as a natural consequence, then everything shrinks. Down, mm-hmm. You know, and so it's. I want my gym to be a place where people work on the skills that they then take out in the world and do. Right. Right. I don't want my gym to be like the only physical thing that they do. And just physical. Yeah. Right. I think that's what I'm, I'm honestly learning all the time. Like I was very much of the physical mindset, which a lot of us are when you're full of testosterone, 18 years old and stuff. But as I learn more, it's like, man, it's, uh, I put up a thing the other day as like, get rid of your body as the barrier. Like a lot of training, you know, or yoga or meditation to me is now eliminate the, the kind of restrictor plate on your body. So you can go do whatever you want a in the, the physical realm. But also if I want to sit down and meditate, my back doesn't kill me. Yeah. Um, if I want to go play with my kids, my back's not killing me. And now your body isn't that barrier. My concern is that the fitness industry industry is I feel like is driving us more toward gymming just a gym. Yeah. Right. So your, your success in the gym is an end result in and of itself. And I found having sort of stumbled along that path myself at a, at a certain time that that was way more limiting. Mm-hmm. Right. When I pursued powerlifting just for powerlifting, that's all I did. Mm-hmm. Right. Oh, I'm not going to go do that because it might mess with my gains. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Right, um, I get, I, I'm with you, man. Uh, I was poking around on your blog and I saw something about you used to trail run. Yeah. And then your blog was kind of saying like, man, I kind of pushed that to the I side. Did because I thought it was eliminating. It was, it was a barrier to something else that I thought I was supposed to do. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, when you're 6'2 and 260 pounds, you're supposed to power lift, right? Mm-hmm. That's what you're built for. You know, pick up heavy things. Yeah. Right. And if you run, then that impedes your ability yeah. to pick up heavy things. Which it 110% does. Yes. But then the question is, do I want to be a power lifter or do I want to be a, a whole dynamic human that's pretty well developed physically, mentally, spiritually, all that stuff? Do I want to devote my life to picking something up and putting it right back down? Yeah. Once. Nothing wrong with I mean, there... No, there's nothing wrong with it, but it's also limiting. Yeah. You know? and If so, you're really good at something, you got to be bad at something and if, else. if your life is wrapped up around competition and that's what gives you fulfillment, please, by all means, 100%. go for that and enjoy that. That's great. Um, 
Mine's not. Yeah. And quite frankly, I'm a pretty crappy competitor, right? <laughs> you know, so why push myself in this direction that actually limits my mm-hmm. ability to do things that I do enjoy? Yeah. Right? Like being out in the woods and doing trail runs and, you know, jujitsu and martial arts and things that I am pretty good at, mm-hmm. right? Because I was trying to pursue this other thing. Yeah. Um, well, I ran into that with trail running. I mean, this year has been very different from the past five. I I went through the whole gambit of I kind of fell into running. Then I realized, oh, I'm kind of good at it. So then you get that little bit of like, oh, I'll keep going because yeah. anything we're good at, we want to keep doing more right. of versus yeah. if we're not good at it. And got so far as like, man, I think I could be somewhat elite competitive. Quickly realized it, I wasn't that elite status. So then that deflated me a bit. But then after we did a... Did a big race out in Montana and then did another big race out at Lake Martin. And I, at mile 25 of this uh, Lake Martin 27 mile race, I sat down on some moss. Hey, I was just dying. I sat down. I was like, this isn't, it wasn't that it wasn't fun. I was just like, I'm over it. Like, I'm not in it to go run the race. I like to go out and run the trail because I enjoy that. And I got into a point where I was like, I thought I needed to compete all the time to yeah. stay, I don't even, not relevant because I wasn't like this elite runner. It was just like, I thought that's what I had to do. Yeah. which is just a mindset thing. But I'm with you on that. Of But it diminished the other things I could do. I got less strong. So the things I used to be able to do from you know other athletic purviews, time, right? It takes a lot of time if you want to be really good at something. Yeah, cardio takes a lot of time. Yeah. <laughs> and if you're trying to run a business and you know yeah. be happy, do other stuff, have a wife, have a family, all that stuff, it's, it's just you know that uh, opportunity cost. You yeah. know, you got to start figuring that up at some point. Yeah. Well, uh, we'll... we'll Kind of keep going through this. I'm gonna bring up some other stuff. So, do you have any? Do you have any kids that work out in your gym? So, we talk about kids a lot. So, all three of my daughters, at one time or another, have worked out of the gym. Okay. Um, and often on, I have children come through the gym. Mm-hmm. You know? um, so, yeah, I generally, I prefer them to be 13 mm-hmm. or older. Um, and so I've had them come through the boxing program. I've had them come through the strength training program. Mm-hmm. Um, the cool thing about running the show the way that I do and keeping my classes small is that I can cater any workout to anybody's particular needs at a given moment. Mm-hmm. So one of my clients brings his daughter in once a week to train with him. And how old is she? She is, she's 13. Okay. And so... Um, but she's also she's real she's real long and gangly thirteen trying right? to figure out her body. And still trying to figure out her body, and so it makes no sense to put a bar on her back. Yeah, you know so that's that right there should be a quote. <laughs> <laughs> but that's huge, right? That that isn't even a principle of your gym. That's just a principle of strength conditioning. Right, right. Yeah, you know, you you cater the tool to the need of the individual. Right? Mm-hmm. And if that tool's inappropriate, then you work something else. Yeah. You know, we work squats. We work tons of squats. Mm-hmm. But I'm not going to load her back up when she doesn't have spinal stability and she's still all wobbly and gangly. Yeah. You know? can't control your body. Why add more load to it? So, Just... you know, work on the movement first. Mm-hmm. Once, the, once the movement is where it needs to be, then we'll start talking about how we're going to load that. Yeah. Um, and she's still also a really a little kid. Right. I think, you know, from her own mindset when she comes into the gym, she's there to be near her dad and spend more time with her dad. And she's there because this is something that she kind of wants to do. So I'll spend the first half of the session just giving her a lot of uh, body weight stuff, maybe goblet squats, something like Mm -hmm. that. Um, And then the second half of the session, uh, I send her over to the mats and I'm like, I want you to do something with the ropes. I want you to do something with these boxes right here. And you just go and move, mm-hmm. you know, for the for the last 15, 20 minutes. Figure it out, yeah. And, and the stuff that she comes up with is insane, man. She'll, you know, she'll take all of my boxes and stack them up. We have those soft foam boxes, mm-hmm. and then uh, uh, you know, sprint across the mats, vault up onto the top of that, sit up there and watch the room for a little bit, and then she's hopping down, running across the floor to hit the ropes. Mm-hmm. And run so that she can swing out there. I'm like, playing. Why am I going to mess with that? Yeah. Why, you know. The things that you and I used to do in the neighborhood or, you know, out on the farm. And now it's a little sad that maybe we have to create some of those environments artificially. 
but at least that environment is being explored by her. Right. And I think that we're getting less adept at exploring our environment physically, yeah. which I would postulate, and maybe it is a bit speculative, that our lack of being able to explore our environment in the physical realm leads to the inability to explore the environment from an emotional and mental, oh, which leads to all the stuff that we're probably seeing with the, I don't know, that's just my idea, ADHD, the inability to connect, which, yeah, technology is a big part of that, but, like, if you just never learn how to do it, right. good luck later, you know what I mean? I think, I think that you make a really valid point there. That's what I, So you guys offer a bunch of different stuff, though, or do a different... Like, you do yoga, you do yeah. weightlifting, you do... What all you got? Um, my approach to fitness is generally trying to hit what I consider to be the three pillars, right? Um, strength, um, some sort of endurance conditioning, mm -hmm. and flexibility and mobility. So I try to hit those with the option of three different classes. So we have a strength training class, um, our and cardiovascular is through martial arts, so I teach a Muay Thai class and um, yoga hits the flexibility and mobility. Mm -hmm. And then each one of those classes then um, sort of crosses over into each one of those fields as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, Muay Thai requires a lot of mobility and flexibility, so I do a lot of mobility work as part of our warm-up for the Muay Thai mm -hmm. stuff. So that before we get into pad work and working technique, we're on the floor. Um, I'm stealing like a fiend from the GMB guys right mm -hmm. now. And, and using a lot of their um, mobility work because it's very lay accessible. Mm -hmm. And so we're playing with that. Um, again, we're using that in the strength and conditioning classes as well. Um, Celeste is teaching our uh, um, yoga classes. Mm -hmm. and so she has a very strong uh, strength emphasis with that. So it's not just... And she started about, lifting some weights, huh? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so Celeste is a local yoga instructor here exactly. that's kind of turned into a little bit of a weightlifter, just all around athlete. Yeah. 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 So she's got a good, she's got a dance background and mm -hmm. I think that, uh, uh, helps sort of open her mind to, mm -hmm. uh, the benefits of multiple modalities as opposed to, we have a tendency to want to label ourselves as one thing. I am a power lifter. Yeah. Right. Well, What's easier yeah, to is. gain market it's, it's share, simple. tell people what you do. Yeah. Like we said, that kind of like, what is a go-gay? It opens the door for a bunch, but it's also hard to give you that 15-second oh, elevator dude, pitch. The elevator pitch is hard. Yeah, which <laughs> I'm the, I have realized I'm, we are, I'm pointing at Sloan, our sports medicine like mentor was fanatical about you need one sentence to tell everybody what you do. Yeah. And I was, so we're always like, oh, I got to brainstorm. I got to impress this guy. He's going to ask me what, and you know, it was all, he wanted something. He wanted you to refine and refine, which is a process. That's yeah. it's good. I'm the anti elevator pitch. Yeah, I am too. I you really know, am. I've just had to realize that like that's got merit, but at the same time, like w we have been, like you said, we're really good at reducing everything into parts. And that's kind of what's gotten us into trouble in the fitness realm and the health realm. So why would we reduce it anymore? Just say, Hey, this is this, what is the farm? I don't know. Come in. Come on in, see right. what it's about. Come experience it. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, Which I know not everybody can, but if you're in Birmingham, you should. But if you're absolutely. not. <laughs> I, I second that 100%. So let's uh, talk about kind of our little story of uh, when you came in here as a patient. We don't have to get into like crazy specifics, but you had some knee pain. I did. Um, I did. We kind of got through that pretty quick. But the interesting thing for you um, is we started talking about like breathing and bracing because you'd been in lifting for a long yeah. time. Um, and you've worked with some high-level athletes mm -hmm. and instructors and coaches and stuff. Uh, but it was just kind of, I think, a little eye-opening to talk Dude, about, revolutionary. It, like, it, breathing, embracing, and stuff like that. It was embarrassing. Well, for me, it was a, I'm, you know, a 12-year veteran in this industry, and I have. I've worked along, I've just, through luck and circumstance, found myself among, you know, some pretty hefty major players mm -hmm. within this industry. And had just my understanding of how that worked mm -hmm. just was not complete. Well, and I think that's more common than we let on. I think you're absolutely right. You know what right. I mean? Like you, it was, it's been eye-opening to me to go into different strength conditioning scenarios, college and professional and, you know, just different gyms. And I'm always, well, I'm, I mean, I'm a coach too, um, to watch that and just kind of see like, 
man, like there is so much good, but the, maybe the nuances are what the, the biggest problem, right? Like we always want the, the building blocks, the pillars, the principles, right. but sometimes those nuances are like, man, that shifts everything, right? It's just like that one yeah. idea you hear on here one day and you're like, oh my God, that changed my life. Yeah. Not saying well, like breathing and bracing does, course. but yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so basically what we're talking about is we just start talking about like DNS and kind of breathing and how to create diaphragmatic breathing and like intra-abdominal pressure. And you started like plugging that in and we realized that was an issue for you. That's why I think mm-hmm. it hit such yeah. a note, right? If you were good at it, you'd probably be like, oh, whatever. Yeah. But you were like, oh, this is kind of tough for me. Yeah. Um, so then we worked on it. Um, have you been able to plug any of that in in the gym or like oh, kind of key people Are up on it? Are you kidding? Yeah, I mean, it's totally, you know, I have basically taken everybody and I'm like, come here, you got, you got to come check this out. And so my approach to it now is just, uh, uh, I, bet I lay them all on the floor mm-hmm. and I get them into a squat position with their feet up the wall. So mm-hmm. it's completely, you know, a full um, sub 90 degree squat, mm-hmm. like a deep squat as possible. And we go through um, basically um, your breathing. Mm-hmm. Right, so it's first abdominal expansion, then lateral expansion, now mm-hmm. push the low back into the floor, and then we work all the way down to the pelvic floor. Yeah, and I'm like, okay, you feel that? That's what the bottom of your squat should feel. Hundred like. percent. Right, and they're like, oh, right, and then we go into the squat rack and we put a bar on their back and down it. You know, I get that feeling. All right, drop that. Just being able to create that abdominal pressure when taking the bar off the rack. Mm-hmm. is such a huge thing. Because tough. The diff- well, it's tough, yeah, but when you're braced properly and you take the bar out of the rack, it's a it's a micro squat. Mm-hmm. It's a quarter squat. And the bar comes out, when it comes out, you're like, oh, that felt light. Mm-hmm. That felt good. As opposed to the worst thing that can happen to you when you're coming out of the rack is to go, oh. That's heavy. Way you're heavier than I thought doomed. it was. <laughs> you're doomed. That's set, right? I mean, go back and put it in the rack. Yeah, get your mind right. Get your head right. Do yeah. it all over again because just that thought alone is going to ruin that session. That's, and that's, that's set for sure. I was having the thought the other day. I was like, uh, we know in the training realm and then definitely in the rehab realm, the more afferent input I have, right, the better I am at kind of putting the pieces together from what I'm feeling from my skin and my joint the better I do. And I was like, man, if you kind of think about breathing, um, if I'm in this like, you know, secondary pattern, I'm a little like fight or flight all the time. My sympathetic's ramped up. You are going to suppress stimulus, mm-hmm. right? Cause if the lion's chasing me, I only care about the lion. Right. Think about what, if somebody has been in a, uh, you know, an adrenaline rush state, that's what we call focus or that flow state you're honed in. Well, now what if this is my interesting like concept now, yeah, flow state's great for athletics, but what if that's the worst thing during training, right? We're all about getting, like, think of all these, like, flow state places, right? And I've read, you know, all the books, uh, Jamie Kotler and all those guys' books. Like, there's a lot of great stuff, but what if the reduction of stimulus through flow state is breaking my ability to uh, realize, like, ooh, my knee was out of position there, right? Because I was so, like, I just want to get the movement down. So breathing, if I can reduce that sensation, which, yeah, it's about pressure, but it's also about, like, reducing my body back into parasympathetic, um, maybe that gives me better stimulus or better input. Now, we can use breathing to go both ways. I can ramp somebody up. I can cool them down. I can get them right in the middle. So I think you could turn it any one way. But when I'm – maybe I'm talking more from the rehab standpoint because people are usually – they need to gain awareness first. No, I think actually you, you're hitting on something as far as training is concerned because if we go back and, you know, oddly enough, we go back to Tai Chi that I was talking mm-hmm. about earlier, right? That's Tai Chi is fundamentally, it's a martial art. Those movements are oh, martial yeah. techniques that are being performed at a very, very slow speed. What happens is you become intimately aware with every single aspect of that movement. Far too often in athletics, we have an understanding of what the beginning point is and what the end point is, and we just sort of hurl ourselves through Mm -hmm. what happens in the middle. Um, And some of my colleagues, in terms of their training, will take a movement and slow it down. Mm -hmm. Try to make a push-up last two minutes. Yeah, you'll learn a lot. (laughs) You'll learn a tremendous (laughs) amount. First off, a two-minute push-up is excruciating. Yeah. Right? But take a minute to go down and a minute to come back up. Right. Well, if you think of, so Kundalini Yoga, they have the two-minute breath, 
yeah. right? One minute inhale, one minute exhale. You want to talk about like control. And that's where I always, we talked about this in the breathing class that you were at. People freak out, right? They, they, if you do a breath hold or if you do a long exhale, they're like, I want to, I want to breathe. Like I want to be able to breathe, but that's all the training is. It's like, you know, time under tension under a heavy squat or a tempo squat, 13, 14, 15 <laughs> rep. But uh, I was watching Arnold Schwarzenegger video and he's like the, the ability to endure those last three to four reps that most people won't that's where the biggest change comes when he goes not in your muscle he goes in your mind yeah. and he's like that's what makes a champion i just thought that was kind of cool actually yeah. a friend of mine strength conditioning coach sent that to me um yeah i just i always have these thoughts of like maybe we're thinking about it wrong like it's all great stuff if you alter your thinking you're like wait a minute maybe i shouldn't be snorting uh ammonia and like getting super amped up when i'm training now, if I've dialed in all the movements, go do that for that one rep, right? For sure. But in the gym, maybe I need to really like chill it out for some time. Sometimes you need to get jacked and like feel that. Well, so you have an understanding of what competition is. 100%. So it's not the first time you've yeah, ever faced you freak that. out. <laughs> but again, you can't train like that 100% of the time. Yeah. But that's what happens a lot nowadays. Oh, yeah. Because people think I'm. Go hard or go home. And I think that's just a cultural thing of we spend more time doing what we're doing sitting. So we think, well, if I've got an hour, I'll kill it. And that offsets. Yeah. Well, no, it, it probably is doing more damage yeah. than good, right? Because we have now we got to recover and all that stuff. Yeah. Totally different conversation. But that go hard or go home is just, it's grained into America. For one thing, it's grained into the physical culture of America for sure. I think at 46 and... You know, when I started into this, my goal was that I wanted to be, I want to be the old guy in the gym, mm-hmm. right? I want to be 70 years old and still in the gym. I want to, you know, if I keel over in the gym, that will be a good experience, <laughs> right? That, that will be a life well lived, yeah. right? And I'm still capable of being in that space and being viable in that space. Mm-hmm. Which is a great goal. By the way. That means, though, that I have to take, especially having started late, I mean, I didn't start lifting until my middle 30s. Mm-hmm. So that means that I have to take a very long term approach to it because uh, Dan John has this great quote. He's like, I think I have one good injury left. Yeah. But I have zero recoveries. Right? I mean, he's had double hip replacement Mm -hmm. you know all these different parts have been broken through competition over the years and so when you when you look at your training like that you're like i can't screw this up Mm -hmm. so i need to be very i I still want to progress i'm by no means giving up Mm -hmm. but i have to be very intelligent about how i play this and i have to be very intelligent about my recovery I have to be very intelligent about my training. And so, yes, I push, but I certainly don't push like I would if I was 18, 20 mm-hmm. years old and, and still had that myth of invulnerability mm-hmm. that seems to take us over at that age. And I think, uh, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but that's not coming from a place of fear, right? You're not like, I'm afraid to get hurt, so I can't do it. It's more like I... It's just if you know the information, you're like, I know this is the better way to um, do it. Yes, and I'm not willing to give up. I'm also not willing to give up training time. Yeah. Um, a couple weeks ago, I was in Atlanta for a workshop with uh, Dan and Asanto. Mm-hmm. So Dan is uh, uh, Dan's the heir of Bruce Lee. He was Bruce Lee's top student and took over the Jeet Kune Do system. Dan is 83 years old. And the dude still moves like a cat. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that he kept emphasizing was he was like, first off, he kept saying, don't stop moving. Just don't stop. He's like, if you're injured, find a way to train around that injury. Mm-hmm. It's going to hurt anyway. So, you know, don't exacerbate the injury, but move. be sensible. That, yeah. that move, right? He jokes. He says, I take two weeks off at Christmas for family. Mm-hmm. And it, after those two weeks, it takes until March. For me to feel like I'm yeah, eighty three, right? It's gonna take a long time. Um, and it's and he says, and I take a very slow, gradual approach to mm-hmm. that. You know, I don't just jump back into it where I was. Um, so having that aim for longevity and that understanding of you know an on ramp. Mm-hmm. You know, a sense of like I'm going to gradually build this up. Yes, I could probably do more today, but does that necessarily serve me today? Right. If where I want to be is you know 
this much further mm-hmm. down the road three weeks from now. So and that's I'm I'm definitely guilty of just and I this is just my excuse. It's it's a total excuse. I get really busy, right, doing all this stuff, podcast, mm-hmm. business, all mm-hmm. that. Um, I know I need to lead by example. So if my time gets short, I fall right back into that trap. I'm like, man, I got an hour and a half. I'm going to kick my own butt. I'm going to, I'm going to warm up well. I'm going to cool down well. But like we did a workout the other day. I'm still sore as I'll get out. Like I'm only 34. Uh, I have to realize like, well, that's not very smart, right? There's things that yeah. I had to just spend an hour just moving today. It wasn't a workout. Yeah. I was just moving to like get yeah. feeling normal again. Yeah. Um, but like I was looking at something Brett Bartholomew put up yesterday and he was basically like, you as a coach, you do lead by example, but coaches tend to be the most competitive people in the gym because they've been there, done that. They want to lead by example for everybody else, which tends to put us in that trap of like, mm-hmm. well, I'm going to, I'm going to train really hard when nobody's in the gym. I'm going to train by myself and, you know, try to keep that level, but to keep that level takes uh, a little more clever thought. Uh, like you said, an on-ramp. So you got a directional path, you know, you're con- just constantly periodizing. That's all yeah. it is. Periodization, yeah. old school strength conditioning. You just have to put it into play over the long game versus a year, yeah. you know? So that, that's a really, really good point. And that again is a thought that starts, should start with kids now, you know, kids now just get, or are, in my opinion, again, are less competent at moving, but get thrown into moving a whole lot when they pick whatever sport they're good at or they love, and then they just do a bunch of that for years, and then we wonder why they get broke. You know that black and white video that's been running around Facebook for the last couple of years of the California Athletic Program? Mm-hmm. You know, With the, okay. uh, yeah, the gymnasium where there yeah, are parallel you, bars and all that. You've got this, this army of, of studly 18-year-old dudes who are just like, every single one of them is just they can a all do master it too. athlete, yeah. right? And you're like, oh my God, that's insane. What they don't cover is the, you know, the on what it took to get them to that place, mm-hmm. right? And it had to start from a base level, a very, very fundamental base level, mm-hmm. right? Of which probably 80% of the class was like, really, this is what we're doing? Yeah, this is what we're doing today. And tomorrow we're going to add a little bit to that. And the day after that, we're going to add a little bit to that. Mm-hmm. Um, because you don't get to that level especially with a group yeah get to that level of skill without the gradual you know to just throw them to this level you might have a few that can perform it at that high level right but you will have broken eight out of ten right and so we're just not going to look at those eight and we're only going to show these two and that's that goes back to what you said the the dynamic of your gym reflects on you as a coach so a lot of and i i know we're painting broad strokes here but a lot of coaches will put more focus on that that 90th percentile athlete because it, it is sometimes it is more fun it's more fun to work with an athlete oh, that can it. do what you want them to do when you coach them versus having to slow everything down build the blocks but at the end of the day seeing that progress is actually more enjoyable for me now of taking somebody from zero to 100 versus starting at 90 and just playing from 90 to 100 all the time i have i have learned to invert my perspective on that right and so I, the more challenging a client is, right, um, the more excited I get, right? I had a client um, several months ago who was in a wheelchair, Mm -hmm. right? A horrible car accident in college. Um, I had worked with bodybuilders over the years, um, but uh, uh, so beautiful upper body, Mm -hmm. shoulders, giant deltoids, big biceps, all right? But also, in addition to a partially fused spine, this kyphotic upper mm-hmm. back that came from rolling a wheelchair and bench pressing and doing curls, right? And Just your mirror muscles, but by kind of default, right? It was right. hard hard to work on the other stuff. Yes. Oh, incredibly hard. Mm-hmm. And, and as a coach, trying to figure out, like, okay, what can... What can we do, mm-hmm. right? I know these areas have been neglected. I know these areas need to be worked on. And like all the normal stuff that I would do with a fully functional human being, I can't do, mm-hmm. right? So how am I going to approach this and, and tackle these things? Now, dude, that geeks me out more than anything. Yeah. I'm like, you know, I've got another client who, uh, um, she's in her 50s, um, a donkey tried to eat her when she was three years old right i mean how does 
how does that even happen? I'm trying not to laugh because that's crazy. I, dude, it's insane. It's ridiculous. And it's kind of funny. It's okay. We laugh about it, right? You know? That's, so that's a new one. I haven't heard that. Tons of scar tissue in her lower leg. Yeah. You know, muscle tissue that's just not there because the donkey ate it, right? And so, you know, how do you deal with these issues, right? Yeah. How do you, you know, I don't want to be that gym that goes, you know, oh, no, I can't work with you. Yeah. Right? Or just do these five things. Don't yeah. don't worry about that other stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Right. You're you're a human being, and human beings move in certain ways. Mm-hmm. Right. Another victim of a car accident and has a fused ankle. Mm-hmm. And suddenly, you know, and and that was interesting because all of this, you know, GMB stuff that I've been stealing mm-hmm. and playing with, I'm like, she can't, she can't get up on the balls of her feet mm-hmm. and do any of this quadrupedal stuff. Because her foot doesn't do that. Mm-hmm. How do I? How do I work around that? How do I take advantage of the shoulder stuff that I want to do from that quadrupedal position that I can't even get her into? And but that—that's so, the art of coaching, right? Yeah. The art of coaching is not building a program and you know creating your spreadsheet and putting it out to like. Not that that's there is some art to design, but I think the art is when you hit the hiccup. A, being able to pivot on a dime in real time, but also being able to pivot in the broad macro, right? Like, right. I know I got to go from here to there. I've never done it like this before. Yeah. Like, that doesn't exist yet. So yeah. you got to groove that new path, and that's kind of cool. Um, I need to take that mindset and apply it more in here. Um, sometimes it, I love the challenge. It gets But sometimes it gets tough, especially oh. when it's uh, – you'll understand what I'm saying here when it's more of the mentality that stands in the way versus maybe the physicality of it. And again, like we spoke earlier, those two work in tandem, Mm -hmm. right? We gravitate towards those things that we're good at. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, you know, I joke, uh, amongst my clients that I'm like the most difficult client to work with is the hyper intellectual one. Mm -hmm. Oh, (laughs) they are so not in their body. Mm -hmm. And so trying to, to draw their awareness from their head, which they're very good at and Mm -hmm. they can intellectualize anything. Right. And they can, and they'll out argue you, you know, cerebral paralysis. Yeah. They're, I know exactly what you're talking about. And I mean, that's tough, but those to me, if you can, like, I've had a couple of those where, I mean, literally they were, their kinesthetic awareness horrible, right? Like you tell them to do something and it's like the, the easiest thing to you is the most challenging thing to them. But also if we think about the research that would show like um, how movement actually improves cognition, uh, to me, it's almost like a, literally if you just had a, an energy, you know, line from zero to a hundred, 99% of there is a cerebral. If I just go this way, actually it's kind of turns for me into almost like a parabola. Like you'll probably see a mass effect where it's like, man, this person's super smart. If I can get them to move a little bit better, they're gonna be even smarter. they may not be more intelligent, but they may connect more dots. Mm-hmm. So it kind of opens up that creative mind space. Cause we know if you're walking, you have more creative thoughts, you know, if all that thing. So that's where I, I've used that as fuel when it's getting to the point where somebody's like, I'm, this is frustrating. I'm not getting, I'm angry at whatever. I'm like, you like doing this stuff. I can make that stuff better for you through this. And I think that gets missed with people who are like, oh, no, you can't. I'm like, well, I'll show you research because you're intellectual. Read this. Right? <laughs> yeah. I, I try to remind my clients from the get-go um, that everything that we're about to do in here is ridiculous. Right? I mean, there's nothing not silly about even from, like, the coolest max effort deadlift. Yeah. Right? You're picking up all that weight <laughs> just to put it back down. Yeah, on the you floor. think about what you're doing. Like, hmm. You're doing a tremendous <laughs> amount of work to achieve absolutely nothing. You're yeah. not doing any actual work. Nothing was actually done. Right. You didn't build anything. You didn't kill anything to eat. You, you didn't, didn't. You didn't. There was no energy transfer. Yeah. That actually did anything other than move that weight up and down. Right. And that in itself is pretty cool and awesome. Mm-hmm. Right. I love that. That's awesome. But it's also really silly. Yeah. So don't get wrapped up around this just makes me look stupid. Yeah, everything in here makes you look stupid. I've never thought of it like that. That's a good way to think about you know, it. It just from the get-go, walk in here and be, I'm going to be ridiculous for the next hour. Yeah. You know, everything in here is silly. And if you can allow yourself that freedom, then it opens up all these other doors for for where you can go with that. Mm-hmm. You know, and so, you know, we'll play games. Um 
I haven't done it in a while. I stole this from uh, uh, my friends at Body Trap in, in Sacramento, California. But we'll play a, a hot lava free, uh, freeze tag. Mm-hmm. And we'll take bumper plates and the boxes and tires and just whatever. Uh, I've made a few balance beams and whatever obstacles that we can create and scatter them all over the floor in a relatively random pattern. Mm-hmm. And now the floor is lava. And you take you back to five years old, and you can't touch the floor. Yeah, right. And so, it's uh, uh, it becomes everybody is laughing. Everybody is suddenly, you know, I mean, you can't be competitive with it because it's really hard, mm-hmm. right? And and you step off, and I stepped in lava, I did it, you know, <laughs> um, and it totally takes away, you know. <laughs> nobody has ever asked me what's this working right now. <laughs> <laughs> It's called imagination. <laughs> right? Yeah. Everything. You see this? Yes, all of it. It's yeah. being worked, right? There's nothing. Which that's what I think we need more of. Like, yeah. it's all, like, going to a gym, like, if you can create scenarios where you do challenge, not to get too woo where you challenge somebody's, like, you can challenge somebody's spirit by crushing them with a the workout. Mm-hmm. You can also challenge their spirit by doing something they absolutely hate. Because mm-hmm. if they have a little bit of a gumption yeah that's a mental mindset thing too but like if you're just kind of like well this this isn't what i do this isn't for me that's probably in my mind that's less mental and that's more like spirit because what you're saying is like i'm so set in my ways that i'm not willing to get silly right which goes a little bit deeper to probably some ego issues and it's like get out of your own fucking way Mm -hmm. right like you need to realize like that running you go run a trail you're probably more than likely still running in a circle really stupid like just taking what you said right that's really dumb like you you started your car you ended your car yeah i burnt some calories but like like was what what was accomplished i didn't run away from anything i didn't run to anything but if you can realize through that like man i I took an hour to just not think about anything hey i took an hour to improve my body i took an hour to get out in nature like those are all mass effects that now create other effects in our life versus just saying I'm going to X gym for an hour. I'm going to make sure my Fitbit gets 10,000 steps. Like that's so myopic that I think that creates the problem where people don't, they want to say, well, does this, does this correlate to my weight loss plan? This lava game? Like maybe, but does it matter? (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, And, and you know, on the other side of it, I get, I get the Fitbit. I get, and there, there is a place for, I'm not a fan of those things. I'm not a fan of those metrics. I want to get you past mm-hmm. that, you know, um, my fitness pal and tracking your diet and all of that. I think that that can become very obsessive, mm-hmm. right? And it, and it sort of challenges you into a very myopic place. Um, but if that's what you need to get started, okay, that's what you yeah. need to get started. And I'm, you know, I'm okay for with that, with the understanding that I'm going to get you away from that as quickly as possible. Right, are, are, you know, you've been doing this for six weeks now. Are you bored with that? Mm-hmm. Right, I mean, because I've had the tools and I've played with the tools, yep. and you geek out over the data for a little bit, and then you get really bored with it. Yeah, you know, you're like, uh. when you come, and I think the the data driven aspect, which I didn't even expect to talk about this, it puts people in that path. I mean, you think about like I'm wearing this watch right now. You think of the endurance community and something like Strava. It's literally, if I want to get my 50 miles, think how much other stuff I have to give up, give up to do that. And that shouldn't be the goal. And I tell people all the time, like, you know this, like, you will not be a better runner just by running more. Well, guess what? You're also not going to be just a better person by just doing, just working at your job or mm-hmm. just eating healthy food or um, being really nice to certain people and not other, like, you got to try to, like, spread that wealth a little bit amongst, you know, all parts of your life, and then you get better overall. But yes. it's we wear this thing, and it tracks heart rate and miles, so that's what my metric is. Yes. My metric is I write down in my notebook how much weight I lifted, what my percentages were. My metric is my macros. Yeah, everybody's got their kind of camp now, and it's like, what are we doing to people? Like, those aren't human aspects, no. like, whatsoever. Like, I was never really how meant to. community feel about you? You know, how are you connected yeah. with your family? How are you connected with, you know, the people that you interact with on a regular basis? You know, I I want my community to understand that. So, okay, so I have this, this side gig um, called Mental Meatheads. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've got a Facebook group. Um, I have a couple people that I work with. Um, we do workshops around the country. And uh, uh, it's sort of my... Um, 
Quixotic way of, of trying to, you know, have a positive influence mm-hmm. on the uh, uh, fitness industry. Um, and I want people to think about their fitness. The, the, the thing that we started with, with Mental Meatheads, was we were trying to um, attack the industry's approach to fitness from an aesthetic appearance approach. That's primarily how it's marketed. Mm-hmm. If you're not in sports, right? Sports is all performance-based. Mm-hmm. But outside of sports, fitness is all about your six-pack mm-hmm. and how sexy you are and how attractive you can be. I think that's problematic for selling fitness because it's very short-term. Mm-hmm. Right? When is that even fitness? You'll hit yeah. the 18 to 25-year-olds. Right? They will be all up in that and they will buy that. Mm-hmm. Right, because they're at that point in their lives where they're trying to find a mate. Mm-hmm. As soon as you get, basically, as soon as the dude gets engaged, he's out. Mm-hmm. Right, as soon as she gets past her wedding day, right, she might last up until she has her first kid. But once she has her first kid, generally she's mm-hmm. out. Right, and then you see another bubble around mid thirties when that first marriage is broken down. Right, and now they're back in the dating pool again. Right, now they're concerned. They're trying to get attractive again. Mm-hmm. That lasts until third date. By that time, they're adults. They know what they want. If they've dated, if they've made it to the third date, things are pretty much settled. And mm-hmm. so, and so, it's a very short-term appeal. If you can appeal to people and show them that their fitness training actually contributes to them living life better, Mm -hmm. right? That by going to the gym, you can be a better employee. You can be a better father. You can be a better husband. You can be a better member of your community, right? That the things that you work on here have transferred into all of these other Mm -hmm. areas. Then going to the gym is no longer a selfish endeavor. Right? Yeah. right now, if it's an aesthetic appeal, especially with the older uh, clientele and the older market, what happens is, is they're like, yeah, I want this, but I have laundry that I have to get done. Right? My kids have to get to soccer practice, and mm-hmm. all these other obligations show up, and so they put off their own training. They'll even go so far as to join the gym, sign up with you, because this is something they want to do. But if anything comes up in their day, right, the first thing they're going to give off is their workout. Because in their mind, from a foundational place, that is a a selfish thing. Right. Right? Whereas I'm trying to get them to understand that it's absolutely not. Right? That as much as possible, you need to build your day around that movement around that training, whatever that is, whether it's coming into the gym or whether it's your own personal practice, whatever that is, that's foundational to your ability to be the best that you can be. Yeah. Right. So, you know, if you're concerned about being a good mom to your kids, right, then this is, this is how you get there. Mm -hmm. This is one of the ways of a myriad of things that you do, but this is a fundamental thing that you need to do in order to get there. Well, it's like that adage of you can't pour from an empty cup, you know, but like, I think, um, that it's sad that the strand of kind of human culture has been pulled out that the the physicality of a human really isn't important. And I think that would happen in America mainly um, as we industrialized everything, right? Because labor became synonymous with making a dollar, but hard work became the antithesis of wealth, right? You worked hard until you didn't have to. Then you made somebody else do your work, and then you eventually retired, which meant you didn't work at all, but you had accumulated enough to where now I can literally, the goal of America has been for the past maybe 100 years, to not do anything at the end of your life. Yeah. Which is kind of crazy, yeah. right? Get enough stuff, get enough yeah. money to not do anything. Yeah. That's where the, the cultural like thorn in your side has come from, in my opinion, of, yeah, I do think it's selfish because I worked really hard. I don't want to have to work out because why would I? Like I, I sacrificed for my family. I did all that work. Well, now as work is turning into sitting in front of a laptop, non-physical, that's where I think you're seeing that shift back where people, it's completely upside down. People are like, man, I want to be able to, 
be creative, do the things I want to do until I'm 80, 90, which is going to call on my body and my mind. How can I keep those things working the best possible? And then I'm also a contributing member of society by giving back to, via my family, my ideas on my blog, whatever it is. But that's where I think technology is fantastic. It's making people realize like, oh my God, my longevity isn't based on work, retire, or die. It's like I could do whatever I want via these different platforms, but I can only do that if I don't get dementia and Alzheimer's mm -hmm. and diabetes and heart disease and die, right? So it's kind of yeah. cool to see that if you flip that upside down, what you can get out of it. Um, you said that the Mental Meatheads is one of your other endeavors. Another endeavor of yours yes. is this uh, CBD company. Yes. So CBD Life Balance. That's correct. So just tell me, first of all, how, why and how did you get into this? So uh, I was approached by my business partner, who's also a client of mine, um, last year. Um, we've started talking about it. Um, he, uh, he owns another company that does government contracts. And so he was originally approached uh, by the Army. The Army was interested and uh, um, there was this initial research that was coming out that's showing that uh, uh, it had, uh, the CBD in particular has very strong anti-inflammatory properties mm -hmm. uh, and analgesic properties. And so they were interested in, in using this to help with, uh, uh, with the soldiers, mm -hmm. right? Recovery, uh, combat fatigue, um, just, you know, basic training right now is a huge issue right now as we have a population that's coming in that can't even qualify mm -hmm. for basic training. Um, that started us talking about it. We got it. We it started going back and forth about it. He, uh, the government contract side of it didn't work out, but uh, um, he had connections with uh, uh, hemp growers in Colorado. Mm -hmm. um, and we started talking about it. Um, I started taking the product uh, in last fall. And that's the same product that you sent me a sample yes. of? Yes. Yeah. So, we st so uh, he had connections with somebody else who was manufacturing, and, uh, uh, and I tried their product and was amazed at my initial returns. Um, I originally took it because I am 46, I'm very active, um, and recovery is really important yeah, to the me. the pain so, relief aspect. Uh, and the, the analgesic, mm -hmm. just combating general inflammation, um, you know, recovery from workouts. I was, I was probably, you know, four or five months into just restarting my jiu-jitsu training, and so that beats you up pretty mm -hmm. good, so, and I wanted to be able to, again, be the old man in the gym. So yeah. what can I do to encourage my own longevity? I started taking the product uh, within a week. Um, I immediately noticed that I slept better. Mm -hmm. um, my recovery had improved. Um, but those are all real subtle changes. Yeah. Right? And those are the sort of things that it's sort of like when you start taking your vitamins, right? First couple of days, you're like, I feel great. <laughs> right? De and then, Definitely a little placebo playing in there. You're like, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if it's the product or... And then great becomes normal. Mm -hmm. Right? Cool. And so then you you just... You get used to it, and you come back to your homeostasis of your baseline mm -hmm. of this is what existence is. Um, as I had, as corollary to my powerlifting experience and, and having put on all the weight that I put on when I was training that way, uh, my blood pressure had started to hit this borderline area. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was something that I was constantly keeping an eye on. Within a week, my blood pressure dropped 10 points. And I was, and I, this was something that I had not seen a comparable effect in, mm -hmm. in, o, in over a year of, of taking uh, a small dosage of lisinopril. And so I was like, whoa, wow, this is... This now, is, were you still, I'm just curious, were you still taking lisinopril as I, you were taking that? I was. Um, and so the problem with uh, uh, ACE inhibitors is one of the side effects is chronic cough. Mm -hmm. A little and clear in your throat. And yeah. I started developing that, mm -hmm. that chronic cough. And so now I've, I'm off... The lisinopril. I've been off the lisinopril for at least three or four months now. Mm -hmm. I was just like, I got tired of the cough. Yeah. And sure. And oddly enough, stop taking lisinopril and the cough goes away. <laughs> right. Um, that sounds familiar. Right. So I, um, I was like, dude, there's really something here. Mm -hmm. There's, there's, and so we, uh, uh, we developed our, we started our own company. Um, we manufacture our own product. Um, we are one of the few 
uh, CBD products that insist on we only use CBD isolate. Mm-hmm. So our product is 100% THC free. Um, important for Alabama. It's very important for <laughs> Alabama. It's important all the way around the right, country. Right, true. I mean, even Should be in, getting what you're buying. Even in states, well, I mean, depending on where you're employed, I mean, in California, uh, depends on who you work for. Right. Right? You're still, you know, insurance, uh, you know. Well, you it's know, we had somebody interested, and I push them towards you because they were going to do it anyways. Yeah. And they're like, I'm really worried because I get drug tested for work, and they're like, I can't have it show up. And I was like, well, you know, yeah. that's what this product's kind of all about, yeah. so. So, uh, um, I think we have a really good product. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm really proud of it. Um, it's CBD and MCT oil. I mean, yeah. And you were saying it. because basically CBD, um, not that it's a fat soluble, uh, molecule, but it's lipophilic. So mm-hmm. basically it needs to be delivered with some sort of fat. Um, so that's where, you know, you could eat a fatty meal. Um, you also told me, which is kind of funny cause I had another product that I was using, and I didn't put the two and two together. Be like, yeah, most products out there too also taste like bong water. And yeah. then I was like, oh, and like there's literally zero taste with your yes. guys' stuff. Yes. Which is pretty cool. Yeah. Well, the reason creating an isolate is a more expensive process. Mm-hmm. So generally what they do is they just distill out an extract. Mm-hmm. Right. And so that has everything in it. Do they right? steam distill or is it like cold press? It's a, uh, it's a steam distill. Okay. Um, and so, but what ends up happening is, is that you end up with all of the terpenes. Mm-hmm. Right? Now there, if you look at the literature, um, in the market, there's a very strong argument for what they call the entourage effect. And the idea is, is that CBD works best in combination with all the other phytochemicals that are found within, um, the hemp plant. Mm-hmm. And I can't really argue that. Right, there probably is some validity to that, mm-hmm. but there is also validity to the fact that, that my CBD product works in isolation. Mm-hmm. And so, yes, it's entirely possible that a full spectrum product may work better, right? Um, but there's also a lot of garbage that comes along with that. Yeah, and just right? to piggyback that. That's any plant, exactly. Right, if you try to take isolates out of plants, what we know now is they become less bioavailable, even if it's the exact same compound. So if you take calcium out of spinach, right, even though there's some things in spinach like the oxalic uh, or the oxalate, um, those things work together. And if you don't have them, it's you don't have as much absorption. We don't completely understand all those processes yet, but that's kind of interesting you bringing that up. Yeah. Um, You know, at such so our stance is is that at such a time where such a product would be you know safely legal mm-hmm. to sell and consume, that we would certainly move in that direction, um, because our primary goal is to create a product that works. Mm-hmm. Right, I'm not interested in selling snake oil. Yeah, I, I want you know if and and we we have a money back guarantee. If you're not happy with our product, all you got to do is send it back and we'll give you your money back. And I think that's one of the issues with non-regulation of this stuff is yeah, you you're going to have stuff that has, you know, psychoactive components in it. You're also going to have stuff that has nothing in it. Mm-hmm. So I think the consumer, which they should be wary, it's almost it, it falls into the supplement realm. You're like, I have no clue what's in this thing. Mm-hmm. It is a little scary, but like you said, the kind of proofs in the pudding like that's if it works, it works, yes. you know. Um, but I think that's cool. And I think times are changing. Obviously, uh, marijuana, legal marijuana was on the ballot in Alabama, which I think is just a big deal for it to be on a ballot. (laughs) Um, I may be a while before that ever the voting changes. Um, but that a lot of stuff's changing, right? With the maps program and, uh, you know, psychedelics and all that stuff. So if that, if we get scheduling changes on things like MDMA and, you know, psilocybin, like, all these, all this will change, right? So I think you're in a pretty good seat um, having this company already out in Alabama, and it's a it's a good source. We'll put links to all your websites first of all, but definitely that one. So if people are interested, um, last thing I want to ask you, man, is doesn't even have to be completely fitness related. Like, what are one or two of like your habits that maybe you picked up somewhere else, but maybe things that you came up that you think are like crucial? Do you be in a 46-year-old guy that's pretty successful, pretty healthy? Uh, the biggest thing that I'm into right now is sleep. <laughs> that's a good thing to be into. <laughs> I mean, I have uh, really tried to hone in on um, 
I don't know if, if you've read it uh, or seen it yet. There's a book going around, the uh, Why Do We Sleep? Mm-hmm. Um, I just finished, it, coincidentally, I just finished uh, listening to that one, and uh, uh, I was just totally geeking out with my clients. You mm-hmm. know? I'm like, dude, do you know? You know? Um, but even prior to that, you know, that recovery is so crucial and so important. And given, you know, my schedule, I'm, I open up the gym. If, if I'm not opening up the gym at 6 a.m., mm-hmm. I'm in jiu-jitsu class at 6 a.m. So, you know, my day starts early, 4.30 most days. Um, so then you backtrack that up, back out. <clears throat> I don't get out of the gym until 7 o'clock some nights. Mm-hmm. So that means, you know, if I'm going to have any time with my family, you know, there's a 9 o'clock bedtime, mm-hmm. you know, if I'm lucky. Yeah. Um, so then now we're looking at, you know, seven hours, seven and a mm-hmm. half hours tops of sleep every night. Well, okay, how do I supplement that? How do mm-hmm. I, you know? Um, and so I've, I've embraced the nap. I was going to say naps are huge, man. Been proven to be better in coffee I and have, anything else. I have um, actually installed a hammock up in the, uh, <laughs> uh, the attic of my gym. <laughs> So that I can slip up there and we have a napping couch in my office back yeah. there. It took about a month of being in this office. And I, I was listening to a podcast of Michael Gervais. He had, I can't remember who it was. I want to say it was a general in the army. And he was like, I have mandatory naps for myself and my staff. Yeah. And I just thought, how interesting. And then he was, uh, he does like uh, corporate wellness now. And he's like, when I go into, uh, off the link to this podcast, he's like, when I go into a corporation, I see how that office is set up for basically like human function. He goes, a big part of that is like, where can they go chill out or nap and have downtime within the office so they don't feel like from the time they come in till the time they leave, it's just go, go, go. Yeah. Like you have to have a space where you can decompress just like the hammock in the the attic of the gym there. Yeah. So I take a minimum of a half an hour. Mm -hmm. Um, and even so, uh, um, you familiar with uh, binaural beats, mm-hmm. and uh, so uh, uh, there's a there's a program that I have that's uh, you know. What do you use? Holosync. Okay, you'll have to try Brain FM. Okay. Brain FM is not binaural beats; it's AI encoded music, where mm-hmm. it basically um, I can't remember the algorithm exactly, but it basically lulls you into whatever state. So they have a meditation, nap, sleep, focus. <laughs> Oh, nice. So it uses, it's not binaural beats. I'd have to dig into it to explain it better, but it's really cool. That's what I okay. use. It's free. All right. Okay, cool. Yeah. I'll definitely check that out. Um, so even if I'm like, if I'm not going to get a nap, I'm at least going to get a half an hour, you know, in that state. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's been really, really helpful. Mm-hmm. And, and just allowing myself to take that time away, you know, because, you know, as a business owner, I guess technically I have, three businesses that I'm trying to run right now, there's always something to do. Oh, yeah. Right? And so being able to go, you know what? You'll be more effective at any one of those tasks if you take that, especially that afternoon spot, Mm -hmm. right? When, I mean, I don't have clients in the gym at that time, and I'm fighting to keep my eyes open in front of the laptop anyway. Go lay down, dude. Yeah. Just, you know. Yeah, why do we fight that so hard? Why do we go reach for coffee when we're like, literally, you can feel yourself dragging. You're like, just your body's telling you to go do something. Go do it. You know? I was talking to a patient about that yesterday, and he goes, aren't we like one of the only cultures that that's not a normal part of society? Like a nap? And I was like, there's, you know, out of most of them, we are one that it's, that scene is, again, a selfish, weird thing, like a little kid thing. And like, the sad thing is, is that most of those cultures that did have, you know, those siesta cultures mm-hmm. for, for whom a nap was, you know, that afternoon resting period, um, they're doing away with mm-hmm. it. They're, they're moving towards, you know, our school of thought. And, uh, um, yeah, that uh, uh, Matthew... I can't remember his last name, but uh, uh, that Why Do We Sleep book, mm-hmm. he makes a very strong argument for uh, how destructive uh, limited sleep can be. When he makes a point in there, too, of it's not necessarily time. It's the amount of sleep cycles, like full cycles yeah. you go through. So any there are obviously your you know, personal and genetic predispositions for how much sleep you need. But, um, I mean, a, a full sleep cycle can be anywhere from, you know, 40 to 50 minutes all the way up to two and a half hours, right? Depending on, you know, multiple variables. But that's what I kind of took from um, that book and other sleep books like Sleep Smarter and things like that of it's not necessarily if I get 12 hours, that's not great. That could be the terrible sleep, right? It's how many like sleep cycles am I going through in a 
a nap doesn't go through a full sleep cycle. That's the right. important part there. You yeah. want to stay out of that. It's literally to kind of get your brain into that kind of gray zone where it's not doing anything, yeah. right? So you almost hit that reset button. Yeah. Um, but that's, again, it's funny that sleep has become uh, synonymous with like laziness, almost like, oh, you, you're sleeping, you're sleeping on the job, all those terms. When that's, for whatever reason, we've been sleeping since humans were around and it's a pretty important part. Um, and if you look at evolutionary standards, like we used to sleep a heck of a lot more yeah. than we do now, right? Yeah. We, I mean, you know, diurnal like clocks and stuff, circadian rhythms were based off sunlight. And yeah. you think about winter months, like we were sleeping quite a bit, you know, it's just, it's different now. Um, anything else you want to kind of leave off with here? Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to come Absolutely, out with you, man. This is Great just... hearing more about you. Like I said, yeah, it was kind of cool that this first time I feel bad because we were trying to do lunch and I kept, we kept moving schedules. So it's cool to actually sit down get this right. on record and, you know, just kind of talk and, 